Welcome to The Great Humbling. I'm Dougal Tyne, co-founder of The Dog Mountain Project and a school called home. In the spring of 2020, I began recording these conversations with the poet and recovering sustainability consultant Ed Gillespie. We call them The Great Humbling because this feels like a time of being humbled, brought down to earth and, if we're lucky, back into connection with land and soil and with each other. Thank you for listening. Ed, here we are. It's it's episode three of this series and sort of arriving into this going, oh, well, normally we sit down a day or two before we record one of these episodes and we have a chat about what we're going to do and we sort of work it out a bit and then we put stuff into a shared document that's almost like a script and i know that like you're coming with a bunch of stuff about the klf that i'm really looking forward to (laughs) hearing about today and i've got a few things as well but i i'm kind of coming in feeling unprepared in a way that feels good because it feels like it means being closer to what this actually is at its best which is couple of people who started off curious about each other and became friends through the process of <laughs> having these conversations how are you feeling uh, i'm feeling good uh, um I, I i like it uh i am quite a kind of shoot from the hip kind of guy uh which does make me a little bit wary of uh where my own mouth will take me on occasion um but yeah i feel like i i'm sort of i'm safely grounded whilst also flying a very high kite in a stiff breeze. So uh, ready to catch some high-level ideas from um, a place with my feet on the ground, if I'm not mixing too many metaphors. <laughs> that sounds like a, an excellent metaphor, Stu. I mean, I, I tell you how I'm feeling this morning. I'm at, like, It's Friday morning and I'm at the end of one of those weeks that's been like really super full. And some of the stuff it's been full of has been amazing and some of it's been difficult. And... I'm kind of grateful for both sides of that at this point. And I also have this sense of being stretched a bit thin. But Mm. then I was remembering the Leonard Cohen line about, you know, there's a crack in everything. It's where the light gets in. And I'm like, yeah, Leonard, that's true. Also, sometimes when you're stretched thin, if you're lucky, you might be translucent. So I'm hoping that my thin stretchedness today might allow some kind of pale glimmer of light to come through (laughs) i love that you're stretched so thin that the light gets in (laughs) (laughs) there we go how how much more uh um blasphemous can you get than rewriting leonard cohen uh don't answer that question but um i i have a question for you though um and you may have an answer to this that immediately comes up you may not it's cool but i was wondering if there's something that comes to mind if I ask you to recall the most humbling experience of your life. Oh yeah, instantly. Right. Do you want to talk about it? You don't have to. Um, well, it's I mean, it's something I've alluded to before, but um, certainly the 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 trauma and the process of my separation from the company I co-founded was was genuinely and profoundly humbling. I mean, it was horrible and tortuous um, and deeply saddening. But um, I would also say that there's a sort of a a genuine humbling that came out of that hideous process. Um, So, yeah, I I still reflect back on that five years on um, as something which is an ongoing humbling because none of those uh, relationships and ruptures have been repaired. Uh, they have merely scarred over, I guess. Yeah. Now, I always say that a, a scar is is both a sign of an injury and a mark of healing. Mm. Um, but I know what you mean. And it, you know, every time I hear you talk about that, it feels like one of those things where it's not just five years down the line. It's, it's a kind of rest of your life thing that will always be there as a um, something that keeps giving you things to think about apart from anything else. Well, that's true. And and the medical term intention 
is actually the beginning of the healing process, um, which I, again, with my etymological spade, you know, I like to, to dig down into the roots of the words, but um, intention is the first stage of wound healing. So that's always been a bit of a guide for me in terms of what it means to live more humbly as I emerge from that horrible situation. And uh, intention was both the, the the guidance, but also the beginning of the process of, of healing. Mm, thanks for that, Ed. I had no idea about that term. Um, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to mull on that one, especially in the light of the sort of illiches to hell with good intentions thing, which I often come back to. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'll, so I, I'm going to tell you the reason I asked you the question is because I had an example that came to mind for me yesterday, and it's not one of those kind of big landmark events in the way that yours is, but it's almost a kind of maybe it's kind of archetypal in that way that certain kinds of dreams that lots of people have had, mm-hmm. but this happened to me while I was awake. Um, so years and years ago, I was taking part in a workshop in London where a friend of mine had brought like 12 of us whose work he had been studying together for a conversation for half a day. And the frame through which he was looking at us was um, about activism. And at some point in the day, I, I think when I was younger, I, I was more eruptive than I am now. So every now and then something would just bubble out with a kind of raw energy. And at some point, this thing just bubbled out. I was like, does anyone else not identify as an activist? And I probably had a little bit of a rant about um, this. And like, as I look on that now, I still see the thing that I was trying to say. And it's what I said, actually, when I wrote about that strange day I had in January, when I met Vandana Shiva and Greta Thunberg in the same day. And, and there's this photo of the three of us together uh, like, okay, so there's this one woman who's 25 years younger than me and one who's 25 years older than me. Both of them deserve to be called activists. They're people who you know, put themselves on the line in different ways and they have a kind of courage that's very different to anything that I recognise in myself. Uh, and if, like, if my work is helpful to people like that, great. Um, but I don't want to be mistaken for one. I don't want people to claim on my behalf that that's who I am or what my role is in the world. So anyway... I had had some kind of a like letting off steam about that. A little while afterwards, we were having a break. I was in the bathroom in a cubicle and two of the other participants, one my friend whose event it was and the other one, a a filmmaker who he worked with. And the filmmaker was expressing some exasperation, let's say, with with me. Uh, 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 And my friend was going, yeah, I know, I know, he's like that. He works with words, like he's got all of this stuff going around in his head all day, like, you know, don't don't get wound up by it. And it was just one of those moments where you hear a conversation, like there was no no malice in it. Uh, There was some exasperation in it. And it's that humbling thing of hearing how people talk about you when you're out of the room. You wait till you hear what they're going to say about you at your funeral. Oh, God. Well, so the the reason that that came back to me was because I had like, not that experience, but a sort of mini version of it yesterday when I stumbled on a conversation that was going on about the last episode of The Great Humbling. And and this is on the... Uh, there, so we have this thing called the Long Table, which is our kind of ongoing community for people who've taken part in the online series with a school called Home. Um, and it's just a kind of, it's a bit of a dark forest. It's a quiet, mighty network site. And within this, there's a group which I hadn't even paid much attention to that is the the Great Humbling Group, where a few people sort of have a thread chatting about each episode. And I was doing some housekeeping of the overall site and I stumbled into this thread and the thread, and it's it's two friends of this podcast uh, who I hope don't mind me quoting because I like I'm feeling really grateful for having stumbled into their conversation. <laughs> but it basically <laughs> starts with Matt saying, "Wow, the latest podcast is maybe the best I've ever heard. From grief to awe, I'd love to connect with you all to share how we sit with this and all the conversations." And then, like the first response in the thread is is a really long and you know, quite thoughtful one uh, from Dan, who starts by saying, just finishing it now, it's possibly my least favourite. 
But it may also be very memorable for quotes dropped, stories told, thoughts provoked, and irritations generated. And those all go together, not necessarily bad or good. And actually, you know, I when I think of Dan, it's like, I think many of us have had friends at times in our life where you go through phases with this friend and go, I feel like I irritate you so much. I'm surprised that you stick around. And I sometimes <laughs> feel that in my friendship with Dan. But uh, and then the next thing he says, and this bit I've like double underlined when I printed this out. I, he says, I appreciate Ed grounding things in humour at just the right moments. And in, I've written in the margin in big letters, me too. <laughs> and he says but the overarching theme seemed pretty dour the continuing one of hope and the need for it up against horror i find that incredibly tiresome and frustrating for the reasons dougald mentions and touches on and i think there's something there that's been coming up a few times in my writing this year and then in the conversation we had on the last episode which like clearly dan's sort of got his teeth into a bit not necessarily hope but just you know the wonder and the horror and something in that doesn't sit right with him. And I, again, like I sort of trust the difficulty. I trust that there's something that I want to sit with and learn from in a reaction like that. Anyway, he carries on. He says, I wasn't familiar with the, his Illich anecdote, but I share that type of reaction to the demand that we care in some kind of late liberal updated version of the white man's burden. Admit and embrace you're not caring. Rich world caring about the rest is how all the harm is mediated. And it's stifling, boring, uncreative, even infantile. I suspect at bottom it's just a strange game of competitive virtue signalling based on how hard one lashes oneself for privilege or renounces it. It's a sickness and a game to be avoided. Illich's life models simply never taking or not keeping the money. Live with or close to the trouble. Do whatever, just don't be a sheltered child whose adult life is defined by real estate, by location, 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 i.e. segregation from the trouble or anything interesting, struggling and alive. But that's everyone who's played the game correctly in the rich world. And yes, that's the problem. The absurdity and evil of saving up for retirement in the world's concluding run on planetary resources. And just like footnote on that. That's something I've been thinking about more and more, and it's been brought home to me from different directions by several things this year, and I want to write about it, which is actually, you know, the pension funds, but also actually the relationship to time and the shape of our lives that retirement has created and how central that is to everything that's making things worse at this moment in, in history. So maybe we'll end up doing an episode on that. Anyway, I'm going to keep quoting Dan because this just got, gave me so much to think about this. The absurdity and evil of saving up for retirement in the world's concluding run on planetary resources, the international death match that's coming will revise everyone's standards for horror, and a large part of it will be the hordes of nice people clinging to their nest eggs in the global north. And anyway, this this kind of discussion had gone on a little bit before I stumbled on it, and in his next reply, Dan said, I love the podcast and the stuff I learn, the thinking it generates. All this stuff with words is just different forms of publishing, which tends towards a competitive, commodified raid on attention, rather than the simple exchange of friendly gatherings. And that's what's important. It's not surprising Dougal and Ned have had a few shows about the problem of saying anything about some things, unless it can be done lightly, comedically, or poetically. And I just want to, like... Uh, kind of highlight all of that, not in a kind of uh, sort of nodding, oh, yes, you're right, and um, kind of drawing back on anything that I might have said or we might have said in the last episode, but as, you know, th there's just a huge amount in there, and I dearly, dearly do not want my work to get pulled further in that direction that Dan's pointing to, of that tendency towards the mm. raid on attention but i and i when i see tendency i go a tendency is not the same thing as an inevitability but it's a thing that you have to become conscious of and actually make moves and work in another direction if you don't want to just get drawn there and i almost feel like just coming into this episode not having time to prepare in the way that we normally do for me is part of finding a way back to the podcast as being the simple exchange of a friendly gathering between the you know, the two of us with David listening in and then others listening to the recording of it. Ah, oh, 
how does any of that land with you, Ed? Is there like anything that's immediately coming to mind? I'm just relishing that little, what feels a slightly covert insight to other people's conversations about our conversations. And yeah, and I agree, and I agree, you know, you sometimes you don't want to be lurching into that competitive content arena. Um, but certainly I don't think going back to our idea of intention, I don't think that's ever been our intention. You know, it, it no. was, as you say, literally an interesting conversation that we started with. We thought we should have recorded it. Um, and so we have endeavoured mm. to record our subsequent conversations. <laughs> I, I, I'm remembering as well, Stuart Lee had a show a few years ago that was called Stuart Lee Content Provider. Yeah, yeah. Which I sort of love as a comedic leaning into you know, what everything so easily becomes in the the mechanisms of the ways that we are invited to show up in the world and make a living at this moment that we're all in. Um, the other bit that was kind of that came to mind for me that's maybe a place to land this, and then I'm going to let you go for a, take us for a ride with the KLF. But in the current series that we're doing with the school, um, somebody said in the discussion in the first week, they were talking about how difficult they are finding it to talk about some of the stuff that might relate to what we talk about on the podcast or what we were talking about in the series with their grown-up child. And then like two weeks later in another discussion, the same person said, I just wanted to share that I, I was thinking some more about that. And it suddenly struck me, we used to have fun together. Let's start from there. Mm. And that was being said from the heart about this person's relationship with their child. And I thought it was a beautiful thing to say in that, but also something that feels like it ripples outward like fractally on all sorts of scales, because it felt like it applied to a huge amount of what I was talking about in the session I was doing with the group this week, where I was you know, talking about the whole history of modernity and the dominance of more and more of our lives by the logic of the market or the logic of the state. And that too feels like a story where it's like, we used to have fun together. Let's remember how to do that. Um, and maybe that's, like, maybe that's the title of this, uh, uh, this episode, Ed. We used to have fun together. Let's start <laughs> from there. <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's, a, that's both a beautiful um, segue and a brilliant, probably definition um, of what I want to talk about, which is Bill Drummond and uh, Jimmy Corti and and the KLF, because like many of these things, I I, I picked up a book at random, uh, which is by John Higgs, which is the unauthorized biography of the KLF, uh, which is called Chaos Magic and the Band Who Burned a Million Quid, um, and it's a brilliant book. It's one of those ones I I started it and thought, where is this going? Um, and he originally self-published it on Amazon. Um, it then sort of garnered a cult following uh, and then was picked up by a formal publisher. But um, yeah, it's it, it's quite a brilliant book. But I, I wanted to ask you first, Diggle, what's your what's your memory of the KLF? Um, are you Were you a KLF fan back in the late 80s, early 90s? I once threatened to preach a sermon on the KLF in New College Chapel in Did Oxford. <laughs> yeah, because the, uh, the chaplain was sort of asking those of us who were part of the the sort of um the early morning brigade who didn't come to the big fancy public service but just the the sort of pre-breakfast one he said this term i want you all to try preaching a sermon which i have to say was one of the scariest things i've ever done it it was about a term before i resurfaced in uh chapel after having done it but i bottled doing one on the klf and i did one on nick cave instead which seems quite prescient in hindsight but i had suggested that i would uh so i i'm a bit younger than you so i kind of missed the full-on moment of the klf except that i was absolutely the kind of teenager who like wanted to be into the things that other people's older brothers were into and therefore uh, <laughs> like, like this I've, I've finally arrived ed you're like one of my friend's older brothers from when I was a teenager. <laughs> Tell me everything about the KLF that I wanted to know but couldn't find out as a teenager in County Durham. Well, let me take you on a little bit of an adventure. So I vividly remember, I can still, I've got, you know, I've got one of those um, visual recollections of standing in the cricketer's arms um, in Swansea in 1991. And there was a video screen in the corner of the pub uh, which felt high tech in those days, and uh, and the video for 
the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo came on. And I remember sort of sat there with my pint, with my jaw open, going, what is this? Yeah, the blurb on the back of the book just says they were the best-selling singles band in the world. You know, they had awards, credibility, commercial success and creative freedom. Then they deleted their records, erased themselves from musical history and burned their last million pounds in a boathouse on the Isle of Jura. And they couldn't say why. <laughs> you know, this is part of the blurb that sort of stuck me in and going, yeah, because I, I remember that happening. You know, I remember this, this instance. And then... And I remember the conversations, you know, the sort of student conversations that are going, why have they done that? That seems crazy. Uh, you know, and in many respects, it was a, a bonfire of the sanity. <laughs> um, you know, it was literally like, what have you done? Um, and there was this incredible symbolism uh, of Jura itself. Obviously, it's where Orwell wrote 1984. Wrote 1984. It's where Orwell also nearly died um, with his son. They were out in a rowing boat and they got caught in the... Cori Vrecken, uh, which is the third biggest whirlpool in the world, um, which interestingly is also known as, the, the, it's translated as the cauldron of the plague, uh, because it's supposed to be where, back to the Kalich, who we were talking about um, in terms of Dougie Strang's The Bone Cave, uh, she was the hag goddess of winter, where she would wash her plague in the Cori Vrecken, and when it was clean, it was like a white blanket that would be laying across the land which was the first snowfall of the season so they took this million quid there and they burnt it in this boathouse and they filmed it and as i said they couldn't explain it so they, they they took the film and they took it on tour i know that they took it on tour because they actually brought it to cheltenham ladies college um <laughs> which is like a long way away from the world what that were I you doing what in. were you doing at cheltenham ladies college oh ed i wish no uh, my dear friend emma emma normington as she is now emma done it um it was one of my one of my best friends from university and who was educated at cheltenham ladies college um described a, the scene when they showed the film and did a q and a and just the utter disgust of all of these you know young women uh, many of them very idealistic at at these guys who couldn't explain like why they had done this, and she's just like, no, they were just ridiculous. Like you know, they could have taken that money and they could have, you know, they could have put it to a good cause, uh, which I mean, kind of takes us back to Illich and to hell with good intentions and so on. But I, like, carry on, tell us, tell us more. Yeah. So the poster for that film tour, uh, probably which went up at Cheltenham Ladies College before the event. It said, why did the K Foundation, which was the post-KLF name, you know, once they killed the band, why did they burn a million quid? Was it a crime? Was it a burnt offering? Was it madness? Was it an investment? Was it rock and roll? Was it an obscenity? You know, was it art? Was it a political statement? Or was it bollocks? Um, you know, <laughs> so they were covering all the bases, you know, and the public, the public response, by and large, was not dissimilar to that Cheltenham Ladies College response. So people were pissed off. People were angry, genuinely angry at these attention-seeking assholes um, who had apparently gone and burnt a very large sum of cash, which you could have done really interesting things with. Ed, can I just ask you a question? Have you ever burnt any money? Oh, that is a good question. Uh, I don't think so. I once burnt a £5 note with Mary Harrington, who is now best known for um, her very thought-provoking book, Feminism Against Progress, and the artist Anselman Biz was late at night at some kind of art ritual party. I think it was called Art House Party in Hackney nearly 20 years ago. So that was, that was my mini, mini version. Admittedly, I, it's not quite as impressive as burning a million quid. But let's come back to that, because I think that could be really important to, to, to circle back to. So there was this huge Ferrari, and it, was, it went down so badly that actually... Corti and Drummond signed a contract between each other that they wouldn't discuss it for 23 years. And they wrote this contract in typical K Foundation style in gold pen on a G-Reg Nissan Bluebird, um, which they then pushed off the cliff at Cape Roth into the North Atlantic. Of course they did. <laughs> so you've got this mad story um, unfolding. And I just kept thinking... You know, how do you make sense of this? And I had David Byrne, you know, whispering in my ear, like, well, mm -hmm. stop trying to make sense of it because it doesn't make sense. Yes. And but what John Higgs does in the book, which is which is, like, I think, a, like a work of genius, is he, he picks up on this idea. You know, no one knows what the KLF actually stood for because 
Corti and Drummond gave so many different explanations um, uh, in their sort of evasive, cryptic fashion. Um, one rumour was that it stood for King Lucifer forever um, and was some kind of, you know, satanic reference. But before they were the KLF, they were actually known as the Justified Ancients of Mumu, which became their famous track, but was actually their the uh, like original... Uh, yeah, the jams, the jams, exactly, which is a name taken from... Um, a counterculture author um, who's a compadre of Timothy Leary called Robert Anton Wilson, who wrote this Illuminatus trilogy. John Higgs has a sort of fortuitous encounter with, with Robert Anton Wilson. And he says to him, he said, what do you think of the KLF? Um, and Robert Anton Wilson's like, never heard of them, mate. <laughs> and, <he's> like, <laughs> and he said, you know, there's, you know, Probably there's so many examples of things which have come out from the Illuminatus trilogy that, you know, I just, I've lost track of them, but never heard of them. Uh, and so Higgs sort of seizes upon this question, which I think this is the thing that really chimed with me. Is it possible to be an integral part of a story that you are completely unaware of? You know, that nobody involved in could hear the story that was being told? Uh, and in a sense, you know, we're all bit players in one another's stories. That's the sort of slightly egocentric way of experiencing the world, that we have these little overlaps and people are bit players in our grand narratives, but equally we are bit players in theirs. Um, but, you know, his question is, is there such a story, thing as a story that nobody knows they are in, least of all the main characters? And I just, I love this idea. And I'm not going to, there's not too many spoilers in this, but there is like, it's an incredible journey that he then takes you on, which takes in Discordianism. I don't know if you've come across Discordianism, which is... Uh, I have. You know, obviously the, go the goddess of chaos, Eris, um, which is either an elaborate satire disguised as a religion or an elaborate religion disguised as a satire. Nobody can quite make up their minds. Um, Bill Drummond basically signed The Teardrop Explodes and Echo and the Bunny Men to his original record label, Zoo Records, um, in Liverpool. It takes in a dream that Carl Jung um, had about Liverpool. I don't think Jung had ever really been to Liverpool either. Um, there's a stage version of the Illuminatus uh, trilogy, which was directed by Ken Campbell, uh, which Bill Drummond built the set for. Um, and this is where it starts to get really weird. And, and Bill Nye actually um, featured in, in which well, one performance at the National Theatre, everyone took acid before going on stage. So <laughs> Lord knows what that particular performance um, was like. You know, he take, it connects into the Kennedy assassination, assassination, giant rabbit spirits, you know, and the really amazing things that the KLF did, which was one of which, which I think you appreciate if you lived through it, was the legitimization of musical sampling as a creative act, you know, which was really, no one was really doing it. And the KLF were just making these mashup songs by nicking other people's stuff, basically, which was partly deemed as complete sacrilege at the time, or indeed just creative theft. Um, but obviously now is um, the basis of so much of the music we enjoy today. You know, there's Doctor Who novelty records, there's the birth of Rave. And interestingly, Drummond and Corti also burnt a Wicker Man, you know, in the same year as the first Burning Man festival took place uh, in Nevada, in Black Rock. So all of this stuff is going on. There's just a phenomenal number of those synchronicities, that thing that you always say, you know, a uh, joke that the universe joined in on. Yes. <laughs> uh, and the book is like an epic joke. <laughs> it's like, because there's so many different threads coming together. I love it, Ed. I'm, I'm really glad you brought this. And it's funny because it also, it reminds me of how kind of joyfully mind blown you were um, when I got you to read Gordon White's Annie Mystic. Because of course, Gordon <laughs> yeah. is a self-declared chaos magician amongst other things. And, you know, yeah, there just, there is something. Okay, I tell you the other thing that's coming to mind. It's something that Tyson, Junker Porter says, where he's like, okay, the difference that I see between like civilizational systems thinking and indigenous systems thinking is that the civilizational systems thinking is all about trying to create a perfect system. And then you mistake the map for the territory. Whereas the indigenous systems thinking is about building in the tricks to move, the floor, the thing that trips you up 
you know, maybe trips you in more than one sense in the, the context of uh, Robert Tan, Tom Wilson and co. But it's I, there's something of that that's part of what I was whispering to me as a teenager about um, you know, the KLF and like, I loving listening to you telling this, this story now. Yeah. I'm glad, well, I'm glad you referenced Gordon White and, and Tyson Yuka Porter. Cause I think that's really apposite because what Wilson describes in, um, the, the Illuminatus trilogy is this idea of the self-referential reality tunnel, <laughs> which is like, it's a very character culture type of concept, but it's basically, you know, a philosophy or a religion or an ideology that's com- very complete and very satisfying and fully explains all the details of the world. Um, as long as you don't question its central tenet, <laughs> so, <laughs> as long as you don't tackle the sacred cow, you know, and that might be, you know, historically a judgmental patriarchal creator God, uh, let's say. But to that point you just brought up from Tyson, you know, we acknowledge that we all need some sort of model in order to deal with the world. But those models that we use should never be confused with the real world. You know, as you said, and as Tyson said, the map is not the territory. The menu is not the meal. There is a huge difference there. And this was bringing to mind all the stuff that we talked about right at the start of the humbling, you know, the sort of mapping lava, uh, you know, forget the map. Actually, that's not going to be useful or helpful right now. Uh, the, the thing that Higgs brings out in the book is this idea of multiple model agnosticism. And he says, you know, th- th- when the need to fight to protect the truth of your model, that central tenet, when the need to fight to protect that truth falls away, then we're free to use actually a whole bunch of possibly different and contradictory models as circumstances change, you know, and, and it stops us getting into that. Uh, idea of you know actually there is one complete true worldview and it is mine which so many people who are in that one model type of perspective in that self-referential reality tunnel do it's like going well they just don't understand reality the way that i have understood it you know my reality is the one that gets tested and you know when i was reading this i was i kept thinking back to the philosopher that you've quoted a couple of times it's like your actions in the dying of an old story and an old system don't make sense because they're actually for making the good ruins for what comes next. Federico Campagna. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it really struck me. And, and this is where, you know, people listening and, uh, and you know, I think critics of this will then say, well, this is just magical thinking. You know, this is just like, oh, OK, you don't want to in- engage with reality as I see it. So therefore, you're just stuck into magical thinking. Yeah. He, he then introduces uh, the brilliant comic book writer. And actually, comic book writer sounds, you know, like it doesn't do justice to Alan Moore um, and his sort of creativity. But th- there's a line from Alan Moore's book about uh, Jack the Ripper uh, from Hell, where he says... One of the characters says, the one place that the gods irrefutably exist is in our minds, where they are real beyond refute. And Higgs sort of expands on this as saying, we assume we live in the real firm and physical world, but actually we live in our mental models of that world. You know, all our sensory information and memories. It's like, we're not grounded. We're not in that sort of um, animistic space, because even if you look at the physical world all around us, it's one largely made up of ideas that have come out of our heads, that have left our minds, whether that's the chair you're sitting on, the furniture in your house, the recipe you'll cook for dinner, the content provision of this podcast. Um, you know, this, the story of our evolution as humans is arguably a retreat from the natural world into the mental one. Uh, and again, this made me think of that conversation you were having with Charlie Davies the other day uh, about um, the world as a pub. Oh, yeah. Did we take? I can't even remember if we told people about that. So somehow Charlie and I stumbled into a conversation about how you know with a, a sort of an animist approach to um, reality, um, the world does become a bit like uh, a you know a giant pub uh, full of people, um, some of whom are human, um, most of whom you haven't met yet. Um, and I think you did you write a haiku about this, Ed, or am I did I dream that? Uh, no, no, I did. I did send you a haiku, I believe. I'm just gonna try and find it very quickly because uh, 
Yeah, I'd, <laughs> I was in a haiku frame of mind. Um, I was writing some for the hot poets in advance of um, COP28. But uh, this world is a pub full of friends you've not yet met. Don't be a stranger. <laughs> and I think I, hopefully part of where the pub metaphor can go is it can get pretty dark in pubs sometimes as well. It can get pretty <laughs> yeah. rough. I I like I don't want to kind of it's, I don't what what I like about it is it doesn't have to be a prettifying metaphor and I was actually struck by you talking about Alan Moore's From Hell because it's a long long time since I read that one I've learned most of what I know about magic I learned from Alan um, but he I I, I thinking actually I, I'd like to go back and reread that one and spend a bit of time with like Alan Moore's version of what the world as a hell realm looks like, because that's a theme Mm. that was, I mean, it was there in that bit that you were quoting last week from our mutual friend, Tom Hirons. And it's, yeah, it's there in like some of Vinay Gupta's stuff, or even in some of Paul Kingsnorth's kind of Christian stuff about Satan as the Mm. ruler of this world. Like there's something worth spending time with around like the world as a hell realm. I think that's for later in the series. Have you got any more from this amazing matrix of Alan Moore and Robert Anton Wilson yeah. and the KLF and so on? Well, keep going then, Ed. I'll keep going. I'll keep going. So back to Alan Moore's sort of perspective on, you know, what magic is. Um, and he talks about the idea space, you know, like you were saying, pubs can be a source of light or dark ideas. Uh, and the nuosphere, you know, where you've got the sort of geosphere, which is the physicality of the planet, the biosphere, which is obviously all the organic life. And then you've got the nuosphere, which is the, the, the planet of ideas, the, the, the state of reason um, we have. And he describes this sort of notion of idea space as where um, ideas, experiences, uh, and things all hyperlinked like the internet. So they might not be um, in abeyance to the conventional rules of time and space. So Land's End and John O'Groats are geographically very far apart, but in idea space, they're very close together because we often think of them uh, uh, as connected. Alan says, you know, we all have our own little realm in idea space. There's a corner of idea space called the Great Humbling, and probably next door to the long table. But there's also, you know, this huge shared communal space where I, our ideas are come together and they're held in common. You know, we all have a, a perhaps a personal version of a shared idea. Uh, and that could be something, you know, fun like Madonna or negative like Hitler, but people will have a perspective and a view on those sort of shared things. What Moore describes then is like, when we wander out of our little territories, our little realms in idea space into shared space, it, it is like Jung's collective unconscious. You know, and the role of the artist then is to is to wander furthest and come back with the the rare and exotic ideas, and, and it's those mental forays, those excursions, that ultimately end up changing our physical world, and that is the process that Alan Moore calls magic. Yeah, there's 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 so much there. I feel like this uh, this is actually some of the thing that before we started doing this fifth series. We were talking about the imaginal and images, and I feel like actually you've just kind of launched us right out into the middle of that with the help of Alan Moore, and I'm kind of looking forward to seeing where else that's going to take us. Well, exactly, and it's the idea of the mundus imaginalis, you know, the um, uh, spiritus mundi, as Yeats calls it, you know, where the immaterial affects the material. Yes. Um, But but also, like, temporally, um, like ideas in their time uh because it's it's sort of uncanny when you get the simultaneous development of inventions like the steam engine and the light bulb where several inventors invent something at the same time and then the first to the patent office is the one who wins history it's like hey i got there um whereas actually is that an actually an idea that's discovered within that shared idea space and stumbled into simultaneously by several different wanderers who are off on their own little different excursions, and you know, if you want to, if you want to take it more controversially, this is where the ideas of as living things, as spirits, as stories of ghosts, as aliens, um, you know, as demons, as angels, as elves, those notions actually fit quite well with this idea of a a shared idea space. And it's interesting because Jung's 
the whole notion of synchronicity comes from a recurring dream he had, you know, in the early years of the 20th century of a terrible yellow flood, you know, and he, Jung himself described it as a sort of a premonition of the rolling mustard gas of, of World War One, with this, this, this terrible destruction. Do you know the bit that Tolkien had the same dream? No, I didn't know that. So I don't know the details of this. I'll look it up and I'll bring it in a future episode. But I, this is something that I picked up from Gordon White. So both Jung and Tolkien, you know, arguably like two of the kind of great you know, kind of creative senses of that which lies below the rational, whose work became very influential. Like both apparently had that dream in the run up to the First World War. That's a, yeah, that's amazing. So I mean, so this is idea of ideas forming in idea space that have yet to happen um, in so called experiential reality. It really again, it really chimed with me because before lockdown and before the pandemic, before we started recording this podcast, you know, I was I was not really doing much poetry. Um, it was very much the, the lockdown experience that triggered me to write much more. Um, and in January 2020, in the pre-pandemic weeks, I I woke up in the middle of the night with a sort of, I, what I can only describe as a premonition poem that, that I wrote at, in the early hours of the morning. It was called Fox Time. And it just goes, Stirring from slumber, the haunting image of a dark and sinister sea lingers shimmering and oil black, lit by a strip of bright moonlight squashed on the horizon between the waters and the sky. Beneath the surface lurks something I'm afraid to see. Its brooding muscular presence threatens. I can't go back to sleep. Outside in the bone-cold January air, a skittish fox prowls the flat rooftop, our nerves jangling together, hers by the thinly scraped scavenger survival of the urban jungle, no safe lair can be dug in these concrete streets. My unease, the submerged leviathan, unseen but not unfelt, that menaces my dreams. I can't go back to sleep. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, and I had that. I had that dream. You know, that was a dream poem that kind of spilled out of me in January 2020, and and it's this is what more. It uses an explanation because Moore and Drummond sat down. Drummond and Corti went and showed Alan Moore the film of them burning the million quid. Um, and Moore said, you know, this is an idea from idea space. Um, this is magical thinking. This is something you've done which is profoundly shocking, uh, but it's reflecting something that's happening deep in our shared mental world, you know. And uh, and Moore said, it's like a, you've started a conversation and now we've got to wait for the reply. Wow. Well, okay, Ed, you, I hadn't looked at your notes for what you were going to talk about today and you haven't seen mine, but I'm just going to pick up from there because what I have for the remainder of this episode is um, I outlandishly pertinent to so many things that you've just been speaking about there was one bit more from what i came across in this discussion that dan and matt were having on the long table site where dan was talking about the thing that i quoted near the end of last week from john berger uh, and he's like berger's ideas about the purpose of poetry to connect the separated were another great thing shared by dougald but as i listened to that i felt context was missing it sounded fine, but is the poet, author, artist being imagined as a professional, solitary figure producing a commodity for a living? That's not it. It has to be the opposite. As a socialist, did Berger have an idea of art and poetry as collectively maintained social processes? And you know, the short answer to that is yes. Um, but that there are also other ways, and maybe part of what you've been bringing, not least from, from Alan Moore, there is other ways of imagining them not incompatible with what Berger would would bring. But I was literally, I'd, I'd sat with that bit and put it into my notes here, and then I looked at my inbox and I found an email from Ben Eaton, who's an artist who's part of a collective or a studio called Invisible Flock, who I'd not heard of before they're based at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park and he wrote to me and he said I'm writing to you because I've been meaning to all autumn because we've used some of your words in a show 
in Leeds that's uh, open for about a week longer. And, and he said, the show is called This is a Forest and is a response to our failure to convince Leeds and other local government agencies to surrender a plot of land for the purpose of growing a new forest. And we've engaged friends and collaborators of ours from both the UK and SAPMI, the Sami lands in the north of Scandinavia, and the Amazon to help us respond. Your words sit at the entrance to a piece we've made called Howl. To make the whole exhibition, we've been working with a 200 or so year old beech tree that fell over in some strong winds near our studio. Its wood and seeds have been used as the raw material throughout the show. In Howl, we've suspended the entire four metre circumference root plate in a pitch dark space. The room is the blackest of blacks, painted with Orpa black paint called Black 3.0, and there is the faintest of strobe lights that flickers so imperceptibly that it takes a good 10 minutes for the eyes to adjust. We had the image and the material, but we're looking for a frame for it. And I was reading at work in the ruins. It was reading in, in the ruins that I found a paragraph you wrote about death and staying with the darkness and letting our eyes adjust. I would send you a photo, but that doesn't seem possible with the form. And I'm just I, utterly oh, blown over by... Oh, like we, the beech tree. But like the like the bloody beech tree. I, the, <laughs> I, because I was sitting with the truth of what Dan was saying, of like for any of this to matter, for any of it to be true to what matters to me, it can't be about the kind of competing for attention being a content producer. Mm. Like the words have to be composted. They have to be uh, rewilded. They have to travel places that I don't even know about. And here comes this story. And the other bit that I love about it is it's a story of something unphotographable. You can go there and you can experience it with your eyes, but we can't do anything with a camera that will do justice to it. And I love that too, because it's a reminder that however clever our technologies are and however beautiful the things that I can produce using a very cheap camera these days are, this is also a world to which my eyes are fitted in a way that a camera is not fitted. There are things that I can only experience with these eyes and not with a technological tool for intermediating the visual. And that's something that I've kind of experienced very powerfully on various occasions in my life. And I sort of brought, brought back to it. And I just, I like, I, I wrote straight back to Ben and, and said, you know, what you sent me there is so much better than a photograph. Thank you so much. And then I had one more bit, which again, you know, speaks to your story of that poem arriving. And it also, you know, to me, it speaks to the ways in which I do find in my experience, Substack, even if it's in tension with the kind of the economic logic of it in some ways, nonetheless, I, I do experience a, a weaving of conversation and it brings people and words into my life in ways that I'm really grateful for. And it happened this week because mm. I picked up that same Berger piece where Dan was saying was, needs more context around this. And I just wrote a post where I brought more of the material from Berger's original The Hour of Poetry essay in there. And in the comments on that, this wonderful conversation sprung up between Roselle Angwin, who's a poet who I crossed paths with right back in the early days of Dark Mountain, um, and somebody who I don't know at all called Richard Kurth. I'm just going to read their conversation, actually. Um, because it's so pertinent to so much of this. And it starts with Roselle saying, I've been rereading Berger recently, but also thinking a great deal myself about what it means to write poetry from a position of relative privilege and certainly relative democracy, tranquility and safety in a no war zone. I know that poetry can save your life. It has mine in certain ways a few times and needs to be out there, but it still can feel like an indulgence as the writer. And I'd written a reply to that, but actually then came this reply from this guy, Richard Kurt, which just went wham into the middle of this. And the two of them started going backwards and forward. So here's Richard's reply. He says, I know the feeling, but there is no privilege without responsibility. 
A privileged person does have a duty to respond. Like prayer, poetry starts with listening to something outside yourself, interpreting, making it your own and responding in your own words. A gap is travelled, an offering is made to the world, even when nobody else reads it. And then Richard said, may I ask you a question? And this is to Rosal. Do you ever feel drawn out by, sought by, something other than yourself to write poems? That would be a privileging. And Roselle says, well, yes, sometimes, Richard, being a a conduit, I don't like to admit it because it's a bit woo-woo. But yes, beyond left brain, I like it when I can get my ego out of the way and stand to one side of what perhaps, perhaps needs to be said or is at least saying itself. I guess that means you do too. From what you write, I have the sense that you know this field one stands in on such an occasion. And here is Richard's reply. Yes, I do. One thing I know is that, try as we might, things never add up without remainder. I certainly don't add up. This is a source of joy. So I never feel like a conduit for something that needs or wants to be sad, like Muhammad taking dictation from the angel Gabriel in a cave. Rather, the not me that wants to be said wants to be said by me in my own words. It wants me to make it my own. So since it's a two-way street, there is ego in it and ego's energy, will. And, you know, that conversation is still going on. But I just, like, the gift of that from both of them feels like a a blessing and a, you know, a being called back from the temptations or the traps of being, you know, the content provider into the other things we can do that work against the grain of the tools we're using, that work against the the tendencies that we need to be real about and that bring us into uh, inhabiting the world as, amongst other things, a space that's riddled with these pockets of, of friendly gathering. Thank you for listening to The Great Humbling. We're grateful for all the messages we get from listeners and the other ways you support us sharing these episodes, spreading the word and rating them on iTunes and elsewhere. To explore further along the paths we walk in these conversations, subscribe to my Substack, Writing Home, and check out the online series at a school called Home. You can also find us on Facebook as The Great Humbling, and Ed is at Frucool on the platform formerly known as Twitter. The Great Humbling is produced by David Benjamin Blower and the title music is I Recall by Blue Dot Sessions. (laughs) 